Good morning. There we are. Hello. Uh, please stand. Welcome to St. Bart's. We're glad that you're here with us on this rainy morning. We'll pray and we'll begin. Lord God, we thank you for this day, um, a new morning, a new day to come into your presence, to worship you, to hear from you, and we pray, Lord, that you would meet with us. Um, you would speak to us through your word, and that you would meet us at your table. And we thank you uh, that you promised to do that. So we open our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain standing for opening hymn. Morning. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God us that even if we haven't felt that in different seasons, what we can trust about our God is that his hand, his goodness, his mercy, if we are his children, they are over us in every season. And if it feels like a season that it's hard to see that right now, I, we are praying this over you that you would feel the fullness of the goodness of our God, the goodness who created each and every one of you in his image, the one who is with you in the darkest of nights and in the highest of heights and in the daily days, who his goodness is covering you even now, that you would feel the comfort of his love and his goodness. Let's sing this one more time. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Great.
This um, sleepy, quiet, rainy morning, uh, we, we make ourselves still to know that you are God. Um, and we praise you, we do praise you that you are the God who goes all the way um, in your solidarity with us, taking on flesh, taking on the shameful death of the cross, moving through death and coming out the other side in victory. And still we are in the season of Easter because we cannot get to the bottom of that um, mystery that you bring life out of death. So we pause, Lord, to bring before you those things in our life um, that need your breath, that need your life. And we ask that you would raise them up. We ask, Lord, that your spirit would meet us even now. And we ask this in your holy name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word.
Today's lesson comes from Genesis. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked but were not ashamed. The word of the Lord. Be, be joyful in God, all you lands. Sing the glory of his name. Sing the glory of his praise. All the earth bows down before you, sings to you, sings out your name. Come now and see the works of God, how wonderful he is in his doings toward all people. He turned the sea into dry land, so that they went through the water on foot, and there we rejoiced in him. Bless our God, you peoples. Make the voice of his praise to be heard. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The Gospel of the Lord. Let me pray, Lord, we thank you that twice in our readings we heard that you would, the promise that you would pro, you've promised to send us a helper, and we see that fulfilled in the sending of your Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we need your help. Would you come as we broach this topic? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do be seated. Uh, wonderful to have you with us. If you are visiting for the first time, welcome. My name is Dave. I'm one of the clergy here. And you're joining us um, kind of in, in the final uh, leg of an, ex- uh, we've called it an experiment, that we've been running called D- The Deeply Formed Life, where we've looked at what would it look like to not be formed 
by uh, the culture or whatever culture that is, if it's the, the, the Christian culture we've come from or the culture that is out there. And, and what if we found a way to move to the radical middle where we could have conversations with people we disagree with in a way that is not disagreeable? And so today is one of those topics uh, where we're going to, uh, I'm going to begin a conversation this morning that we will carry on tomorrow evening and then throughout the year. And in fact, if there's interest, um, we will also uh, seek to do a, a class on what um, has really come out of a lot of really great work around the issue of theology of the body. Um, but before I begin, so... Um, Today's topic is the topic of sexuality and wholeness. And before I begin, um, as we address such a difficult topic, uh, I, we want to speak with compassion and clarity. So in terms of clarity, um, we hold to St. Bart's as part of the Anglican Mission in America, we hold to a, a historic understanding of sex and marriage where we believe that sex is meant to be expressed and experienced in marriage, and that marriage is between a man and a woman. Now, in terms of compassion, we recognize that when it comes to sex, many have experienced pain, confusion, rejection, abuse, and that the church has not always handled these things well. And we want to walk with people towards healing and wholeness as we faithfully seek to follow Jesus together. And so what I'm doing here is just beginning a conversation, as I said earlier, that we will carry on uh, tomorrow night and as things, uh, as the weeks and months progress. But as we think about the topic of sexuality and wholeness, we can begin in two places. We can begin where um, Southern Christian culture has classically been, or we can begin with where our popular culture is today. And both, both have sought to shape us. And in any topic such as this, there are very loud voices on the left and there are very loud voices on the right. And yet, we, most people find themselves in the exhausted middle ground where if you're in the center and you lean left, you lean right, you actually have more in common with each other than you have with the loud voices on either end. And so what are those loud voices? Well, as an outsider, as someone who grew up in the east coast of Canada and then was trained in England and spent uh, 13 years in England, um, as what I've observed is that Southern Christian culture has historically had a position that hasn't always been helpful, often using shame when discussing sexuality, all while attempting to claim and hold on to the moral high ground. Um, for example, we'll say abstain from sex until you're married and then you don't have to worry about anything. Um, it's left a myopic view of a theology of the body, especially when you consider that the body has often been presented in a negative light, and wherever passion and desire has welled up within people, it's been quenched. And we've been left with a theology in that culture that has divorced spirit from body. Um, our culture, on the other hand, um, so both are trying to do something. And in the middle, I think, is where we find where the kingdom is. But on the left, for example, our culture says that love is God and finds itself on the other end of things and has at its heart a critical view of identity where humans are divided into identity groups based on how they're advantaged or disadvantaged. And the con conversation shifts to a need to battle the oppression caused by the advantaged. That's out there too, and you just have to be aware of that. And in a group like this, there are probably people who have been shaped by both views. And yet there's a middle way. And I would suggest and present to you um, that the middle way is shaped by the majority Anglican view globally. Okay, so that's not, and, and our expression of Anglicanism in Texas 
is not representative of that majority demo, um, demographic. For example, your average Anglican today lives in the global south. It's a debate whether they are in India or Africa. Their life is impoverished. They're likely illiterate. They're likely HIV positive, And they're a woman. Okay, so it's kind of different. I, I'm not any of those. Um, and yet, this is, this is what they hold out to. This may be the middle way, which I'm pre presenting to you, that humans are living souls created in God's image with spirit and body, designed for his glory, intentionally diverse, and equally endowed with dignity and value by God. Championing the cause of the disadvantaged and also seeking to walk with Jesus. Now, it's true in Canada, it's true in England, it may be true here, I'll leave it to, to, to you to think about, that the church has lost its right to speak into the culture. And Christians in these countries have had to pivot and embrace a posture of humility where they serve and bless in order to earn the right to share what they believe. Now, possibly, I'm going to uh, admit something to you, I'm possibly the worst person to talk on the topic of sexuality because when I was in middle school, we were tested after sex ed. Uh, I was shocked, I'd never failed anything in my life. And I was shocked to see that I'd gotten an F minus on my test. And I couldn't figure out how to share this with my parents. So as I walked home with the weight of failure on my back, I struggled to find the words to say. How would I explain this? Um, you know, we were told, and I love it, um, we, don't, um, we, we don't want you to achieve and get A's. And we won't reward you for it. We expect it of you. Okay, so that's kind of, that weight was on my back, and as I struggled to find the words to say, I, I was in the kitchen, my mom was there, newly appointed to the, uh, the federal court, and I'm fighting back tears because I've never failed anything, and I slide the test across the counter to mom. She looked it over, saw that I didn't know how to label the diagrams, and uh, saw the F minus, and she gave me a hug and said, I've never been more proud. Would you like a cookie? <laughs> well, we have three children, so I, I kind of figured it out. Um, but in today's world, in today's world, what do we mean by sexuality? How do we define sexuality? Well, I think um, modern day theologians agree on this, that sexuality can be described as the deep desire and longing that drives us beyond ourselves in an attempt to connect with and to understand that which is other than ourselves. Essentially, it's a longing to know and be known by other people. And what we find is, is that there are two aspects of sexuality. The term takes some use, getting used to, for me, as you could tell by my failure in sex ed, is that there's a social sexuality that is, we all have this innate desire to belong and to know and to be known and to have friends and to find our place in community. There's also an intimate sexuality which happens, um, um, you know, Bill Clinton, I think, ruined it all for us. What, do we, what, what is sex now? But, you know, that's kind of the, uh, sorry, that was a joke. There may be others. Um, but that, that's what happens in an intimate setting. And if you turn with me to, to Genesis chapter 2, we're just going to look. I don't have the time to deal with it all, but just a little few, a few notes here. And we look down and read verses 23 and 24. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? Verse 20, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. Probably the first name for chicken was dinner. And again, uh, But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God, verse 21, caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up his place, his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, 
This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she, has ta- she was taken out of man. This, this, this term, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, is the language of blood relatives that is used throughout the Old Testament. And when no suitable companion is found among all the living beings, God fashions a woman from the man's own flesh. God brings joy to the world one rib at a time. Um, Again, a bit of humor, I apologize. I'll work. I know, it's hard, isn't it? From the beginning, there was meant to be a deep sense of oneness that exists between the man and the woman. And they shall become one flesh. And this is where we come to the topic of sexual wholeness. Now, you'll see in the back of our bulletin, we have these values. And that we've talked about these values before, but if you're new, just turn with me, and you'll see that wholeness is something that we've actually thought quite a bit about. And we understand wholeness here at St. Bart's that in Christ, we've seen both the face of God and the fullness of our humanity. So we trust God to transform us more and more into his image and likeness. And as we're transformed, we're more and more able to love God and our neighbor. And so there's actually a wholeness to be had in the idea of sexuality which the beginning point that we have that differentiates us from the left is that we believe there's brokenness everywhere. We believe there's brokenness everywhere. And sexual wholeness requires discernment around the question of who I give my body to. And our culture rarely urges self-control. But rather, if it feels good, why shouldn't you? Or are we not to be driven by our own desires? Are we not to be driven by our passions? And our culture has devalued sexual intimacy. And yet the truth remains that sexual intimacy is a fire. It's such a powerful force that bonds people together so tightly, so strongly, that it needs something stronger than a simple relationship to sustain it. It requires the language of covenant and the covenant of marriage to contain the fire. Sexual intimacy is an act that gives expression to marriage vows. It's why the Catholics have got to a place where they believe that marriage is a sacrament. Um, Because the body is viewed as something sacred something that has been shaped by God, designed for a relationship with God, so that we would share in God's glory. That's why we were made. And so there is something sacramental about it. In a way, the act of intimacy says with our bodies what was promised we would do in our wedding vows. And so it becomes the expression of covenant, and it's cheapened, when it's done outside of the covenant of love expressed in marriage. Because your body is sacred. And that union with another person points the union we have with God and requires discernment. Chapter 2 ends in verse 25 with an incredible depiction of what it means to be fully human. And that's one of the things, and if you ever read our stationery, there's a a line at the end which says, remind me, Chris, I'm exact, you were born to, you were made to be fully human. You were made to be fully human. And that's true. That's something we believe deeply. And what what does it mean to be fully human? It means to be naked and not ashamed. Naked and not ashamed. These words describe their relationship to God and their relationship to one another. And here's the thing. Don't miss this. This is true of Adam from the beginning. And so it actually says something rather countercultural is that to be single is actually very good. It's not bad. It's elevated. The challenge is, is in a culture that is over-sexualized, friendship becomes harder to have because there's only, our culture is pushing one way of connection. And 
but we need friends. And so naked and unashamed is true of Adam from the beginning, and it's true of Adam and Eve together. It connects the overstep that our Southern Christian culture has made in idolizing marriage. Adam was naked and not ashamed before Eve and after. And that, what does it mean to be naked? Well, obviously it means something physically, but uh, it also meant that they had lives that were vulnerable to each other, undefended, unguarded. What would it be like to be completely undefended and unguarded all day long? It would be terrible today because you'd be beat up, battered, and left, a stain on the rug. Um, But the word naked isn't really talking about clothing. It's talking about connection. And so the social aspect to it is that we would be in communities together where there is an appropriate, healthy, intimate, vulnerable connection amongst friends. Where you don't just connect as you come to church, but actually the church becomes a place where you make lifelong friends. And it's the absence of these relationships that empower the curse that comes. Because we don't have anyone we can go to with our deepest, darkest secrets that we think are shameful. We hide them and they they, they grow in our hearts and they make our hearts sick. But if we had a way to connect where we could feel free to be unguarded appropriately and vulnerable, our lives would change. And so we were made for a particular life of vulnerability and connectedness. We were made to connect deeply with one another and we long for it. And so vulnerable and connected applies to our friendships. It applies to our parenting. I tell you, I will often look at how other parents parent and think, if only I could do that, my life would be better. And I begin to objectify the parenting ability of others around me. And you know what that's driven by? Shame. But there is a connectedness that applies to every area of our life, a connectedness to God and to our peers, where we're vulnerable and connected in our relationships, and that that is what God has intended for us. And the picture we have painted for us is that love is a form of love that is free from body shaming, free from comparison, free from objectification, where there's a unity between them and God, their creation and their bodies. But then something happens in the story, doesn't it? They rebel. They do their own thing. And the moment they eat from the tree they shouldn't, there's an immediate change. Sin and shame entered the world. Vulnerability is gone. The unity is shattered. And the freedom is gone. And now their lives are marked by hiding, estrangement, shame, and sin. And as a result, we all experience brokenness in our relationships because we were designed in his image, to share his glory, that we would have all of our needs met in him. When couples come to see me, present company accepted, I've been ordained 20 years, so if I look back before coming to St. Bart's, couples would come with problems, and the majority of the problem is what they're trying to meet all of their needs in the other. I was like, well, that's not gonna work. I was like, how do you know? I said, because it doesn't. We were designed to have our needs met with Jesus, but the problem is is that we've been so shaped by the messages that have come from a Christian culture that we're thinking, oh, how, how could I, how would that work? So we experience brokenness in our relationship. And shame is a funny thing, isn't it? Because shame is easier to describe sometimes than it is to define. The result is that shame makes us feel like we are bad. It's not that I did a bad thing, it's just that I can't escape this feeling that I'm not enough and I am bad. 
I am worthless, I am not good. And that's not from God, and it should never, ever come from the church. And so there's no shame here. There's only grace. There's only grace. There's something all of us, this shame is something all of us experience to varying degrees at different moments in our lives. Shame tries to lead us to turn away from God and away from people. Shame isolates and shame destroys. And yet we find ourselves with Jesus who in Revelation stands at the door knocking, asking if we would invite him in. And as we invite him in, the promise is that he would come in, sit with us, and dine with us. That we would encounter a new kind of freedom. And what is that freedom? Well, that freedom is the end of shame. Shame because of things you've done. Shame because of struggles you've had. Shame because of what you've been, what's been done to you. And look, shame is not easy to get rid of. And so when people come and, and talk to us, and you know, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a therapist, but when shame is the issue, we refer right away. Because if shame is a, is a problem, and it is for most of us, we need to receive as much as we can so that shame can be put in its place at the feet of Jesus. Jesus has taken on shame. He's taken on shame in his body so that we don't have to carry it in ours. In the garden, Adam and Eve hide behind a tree naked, covered in shame. But in Jesus, the story flips. What does Jesus do? He hangs on a tree naked and conquering. Adam and Eve hide, Jesus hangs. Adam and Eve are naked, Jesus is naked. Adam and Eve are covered in shame, Jesus conquers shame. And that's the hope that we have to offer. That's why going to the middle ground is so important. Not that we have a right to tell the world what we believe, but we have an opportunity to earn a chance to share the hope that we have in Christ. Because we were made for more than this. We were designed for his glory. Intentionally diverse, equally endowed with dignity, and valued by God. I'm gonna pray, but I have hit and every one of us is affected by this in, on every side. And, we've, and we're choosing to speak into the silence because we want all y'all to feel like you can reach out to me and to Chris so that we can meet with you and talk to you. There's a lot more to be said on this topic. And there's a lot of great, rich resources on how to navigate this discussion. Because we are in a day, an age, where we need to sit and reason this out and think it through and share what we believe. Because the voices, the loud voices on each side will keep trying to shape us. And each side has a kernel of truth. And yet Jesus invites us to become whole by beholding him. So that as we behold him, we become like him, and as we become like him, it becomes easier to love him and to connect with our neighbors. But let me pray. And, and as we pray, I wanna pray especially for people here or watching online where shame is a powerful force. And one prayer may cut it, may not. Sometimes we pray, something happens. Sometimes we pray, everything happens. I don't understand it. God does. 
But we're a community called to walk with each other. To be not just a church where you can connect with people, but where our prayer is lifelong friends are made. Where we're a community where you can share what's on your heart or who's on your heart that is deeply affected by this. So let's pray. And uh, as we come to the Lord's table in a moment, I'm inviting you, and the Lord, more importantly, the Lord is inviting you to bring your burdens to him. And as you come up to receive the bread and the wine, to unburden yourself, to leave it at the table, so that, as, so that in exchange you can receive his presence, his body and his blood, so it would nurture you and fill your heart with hope that he is in the sure knowledge that he's with you. So let's pray. Lord, we need your help. We need your help. Thank you that you've called us to be in a community where we don't all have to agree on these cultural issues, but we are here together all looking at you, and we need help. We need help especially in the face of shame. And so even now, Lord, we lift you those of us in this room who in our hearts, in the quiet of our hearts, shame is there lurking even now that says that we are bad. It's not that we've done something, but we're just bad. And Lord, that's not true. And so, Lord, we ask that by your Spirit you would come and search our hearts. And that we ask that as we lift high your cross, where you conquered shame by taking it onto your body, that even though it broke your body, you conquered the power of sin and shame. We ask even now, Lord, that you would, by the power of your blood, that you would contain shame and drive it out. That we would take a step closer today to knowing that connection with you more deeply and also with our neighbors, our friends, those we're in community with. Help us to connect and belong. Bless those in our midst even now who are single. Bless those in our midst who are married. Lead us as a community to be a community where we know that our needs are ultimately met in you, Jesus, so that we can then serve those around us. And help us as a church to be a people who can disagree without becoming disagreeable. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? <clears throat> and on page five, let's affirm our faith by saying the words of the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And Let's share with one another a sign of God's peace.
As the kids come in, uh, please be seated. We just have a few announcements. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Chris Myers. I'm one of the priests here. Um, the kids keep coming. Here they are. Um, if you are new to St. Bart's or have never filled out a connection card, we would love uh, to connect with you, get to know you. On the back of your bulletin, there is a card that you can tear off, fill out, and put into the offering plate as it goes by. If you have any prayer requests or would like to meet with the clergy or someone from the staff, you can put that on the card as well. Um, it's kind of the place to put anything that you might need. Just a few uh, other announcements. Uh, today, right after the service, we have um, our continued uh, conversation on, around money, kingdom mindset money, and the topic is giving. Jeremy Aracliffe will be teaching on that, and it's in room 214, uh, which is right outside these doors up the stairway to the, to the left. Um, even if you haven't registered for the class, such a big topic, maybe you have questions about that, how we think about giving at St. Bart's. He'd love to, uh, to have you and host you in that class as well. Tomorrow is Deeply Formed Life, and we'll be discussing uh, what Dave talked about in the sermon, and we'll be discussing um, chapters 7 and 8 uh, from the book Deeply Formed Life. Uh, and just as a reminder, because it's been a while since we've done it, uh, the book Deeply Formed Life has a, a chapter um, for each of the topics has a chapter on the, the ideas and then a set of practices that go uh, with it as well. So when we have the conversation, uh, we're talking about both things. Um, and one of the questions we always ask is, what's missing from these chapters? So if you're going to read these chapters, that's a great question to keep in mind um, as we come into conversation tomorrow um, at Olivella's for Deeply Formed Life. And then our last session of Deeply Formed Life will be on May 13th for the final section, which is on the theme of missional presence. So we'd love for you to go ahead and register for that. Uh, we know that May is kind of a crazy time, um, so we're doing a little bit earlier in the month. Uh, please go ahead and register for that um, if you'd like to join us for that last uh, conversation. During the summer, we're going to be having some family pic picnics. You can see the information there as well. And then after this service, um, if you're a newcomer, if you're new to St. Bart's in the last few months, we'd love to have brunch with you. So we're having a newcomer's brunch um, at Maya's at 11 a.m. Maya's is in uh, Casa Linda, right at Buckner and Garland. We'd love for you to come talk with us. Dave and I will be there. The staff will be there. Uh, some of our key leaders will be there. We'd love to uh, buy you brunch and get to know you a little bit more. So make time for that as well. Um, as Dave was talking, he hit the topic of shame. And maybe some things were stirred up. Maybe some things were drawn to mind. So we just want to remind everyone that we have prayer teams, people who would love to pray with you, um, to lift your burdens uh, to the Lord together. They are trained and vetted. They are uh, trustworthy people, um, and they keep things in confidence just to state the obvious about all that stuff so that you feel comfortable um, receiving prayer from them as well. And as we come to our time of Holy Communion, if you are baptized and following our Lord Jesus, you're welcome at this table as you come forward we will dip the wafer for you in the wine, and we will place it in your hands. So simply place your hands like this. Um, if you need a gluten-free wafer, you can place your hands like this. If you don't want to receive communion for any reason at all, you can place your hands like this, and we will pray a blessing over you. Um, I would usually say walk in love. We should still do that. Um, but I will say for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross, despising its shame. So let us draw with confidence to the throne of grace in our time of need.
celebrate this Holy Communion with giving glory to God and in thanksgiving for David and Cindy Lewis's 50th wedding anniversary. Is the Father with us? Yes. Is Christ among us? Yes. Is the Spirit here? Yes. This is our God. We are His people. We are Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is right and our delight to give you thanks and praise. Great Father, living God, supreme over the world, creator, provider, savior, and giver. From a wandering nomad, you created your family. For a burdened people, you raised up a leader. For a confused nation, you chose a king. For a rebellious crowd, you sent your prophets. And in these last days, you've sent us your son, your perfect image, bringing your kingdom, revealing your will, dying, rising, and reigning, remaking your people for yourself. Through him, you've poured out your Holy Spirit, filling us with light and life. Therefore, with angels, archangels, faithful ancestors, and all in heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Almighty God, owner of all things, we thank you for giving up your only Son to die on the cross for us who owe you everything. Pour your refreshing Spirit on us even now as we remember him in the way he commanded through these gifts of your creation, who on the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Amen. His body was broken for us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in the remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ <clears throat> will come again. We are brothers and sisters through his blood died together, we will rise together, we will live together. Therefore, Heavenly Father, hear us as we celebrate this covenant with joy and await the coming of our brother Jesus Christ. He died in our place, making a full atonement for the sins of the whole world, the perfect sacrifice once and for all. You accepted his offering by raising him from death and granting him great honor at your right hand on high. Amen. This is the feast of victory. The Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Hallelujah. Please remain standing as we sing together the words Christ has taught us. Our Father. forever. We are because he is. We are one body. We share one bread. 
Draw near with faith. Christ is the host, and we are his guests. Beloved of God, these are the gifts of God given to you, the people of God. As you come to his table, come and lay down your burdens, trusting that he has taken all that is necessary, every step necessary, that you might have life and become fully human. Take and receive these gifts and remember that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen.
He's the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Lord, we thank you for feeding us, for giving us your presence, food for the road for this week. And we ask that even now, you would go ahead of us and prepare the way for us to walk through all that we'll do between now and when we meet together. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Do be seated. Who has a birthday this week? Come down. We love to pray for you. That's it. We got two, three. Fantastic. That's it. Come on up, Cole. You got this. Cole, how old are you going to be? Eight. Eight. Fantastic. <coughs> Wonderful. Let's stretch. Oh, one more. Wonderful. <laughs> let's stretch out a hand of blessing and let's pray uh, for these bo- birthday boys and girls together. Watch over thy children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them where they stand. Comfort them, discourage yours. May thy peace which passes all understanding abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday. High five. That's it. Well done. Will you join me in standing and let us pray together. Children, we need your, hand, your help here. Okay, you ready? Let's put a hand on our heart. Together, Father God, fill us with your love. Help us to love you in everything that you've made. Let's point to our eyes. Lord Jesus, help us to see you and to see others the way that you see them too. Let's point to our ears. Holy Spirit, help us to hear you and give us courage to do what you say. Together, Alleluia, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Hallelujah. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day, this week, and forevermore. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn.
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.